It said that uh, some of our fellows just rested their, their guns on the wire and fired from there while others uh, uh, tried to uh, deal with the wire. But Nigger Wilson ran along the, 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 the wire in front of us and he found the opening which had been left to let their own patrols through. But because he was an old soldier, he knew he'd find that opening and he led us through the, the wire. The wire was alive with bullets as we went through. And he just bellowed out, form a line, charge. And then we went, took the trench. Hello podcasters, it's great to be bringing you another episode of living history. How wonderful was the account from Gary Mackay last week about his service in Vietnam? If you haven't checked that podcast out, rush out and do it straight away. It was incredible. Gary Mackay served in Vietnam and gave us an incredible account of his involvement in the Battle of Nui Lai, just absolutely gripping. And I'm really excited to say that that was the first in a series of veterans accounts I'm going to bring you, and I've got some World War II veterans lined up that I'm going to be talking to in the next couple of weeks. Really excited about that. There's nothing like hearing about these battles from the men who were there. So look out for those coming up in the next couple of weeks, my interviews with World War II veterans. Today, we're going back to the First World War, a place very close to my heart, and we're going to talk about a battle that has become famous in recent years in Australia because of the discovery of a mass grave, the Battle at Fromel. This was a battle, the first battle the Aussies fought on the Western Front, and it was a disaster. The most costly 24 hours in Australian military history. More than 5,500 men killed or wounded. Just think about that. The numbers of men lost in one night of fighting, 5,500. It was absolutely horrific. Uh, And it's a misunderstood battle. We don't understand today why it was fought. We don't understand what we were doing there and what could have been done differently. So today we're going to look at that in detail and try to unravel some of these mysteries of Fromel. So we're joined by Roger Lee, and for 20 years, Roger was the head of the Army History Unit. He was the the main historian in charge of looking back on our Army history. Roger was heavily involved in research into the Battle of Fromel and many reports about the Battle of Fromel and the history of the Battle of Fromel. But in more recent years, he was very heavily involved in the uncovery of the mass grave and the identification of those soldiers. So there's no better person to talk to about both the history of Fromel and the modern history of this battle and our new connection with the soldiers who fought there because of the discovery of this mass grave. So I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you enjoy it. A date which will live in infamy. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was our final tower. Roger, thanks for joining us to talk about this, the famous Battle of Fromel. Why don't we start, just so we've got some, uh, some background on this, why don't you give us your overview on exactly what was happening on, on, on the history of this battle? What went on in July 1916 at the Battle of Fromel? Okay. Uh, for a start, the reason it's famous is um, is part of the problem that I have with this whole battle. Um, it, it shouldn't be famous for the reasons that it is famous, and we can talk about that in a minute. But fundamentally, what Fromel was, was a, a secondary operation as part of the overall Somme campaign. Uh, the Germans had been moving reinforcements from all up and down its line, from Italy and even from Russia, because of the um, the effect of the Battle of Verdun. On the, on the German army. It was suffering enormous casualties. And then Somme rolls in and, and, uh, and increases the, the, the loss rate by a, a large order of magnitude. And the Germans are starting to come a bit uh, short of troops. They're looking for uh, reinforcements, replacements. Um, they're starting to call up younger year um, conscripts into the conscription system. And they're also combing out troops from less threatened areas of the front. And one of the areas that they were combing troops out of was around Lille. And Lille is the main city near Fromel. And British intelligence was picking up the fact that there were these German soldiers popping up who were originally in the Lille garrison. Uh, The the Brits were well aware that they were going to have to mount the uh, operations to stop the Germans doing that. That's a standard military tactic, so everyone's aware of it. And they've got to try and stop them doing that. 
And so when the planning for the Somme offensive had begun, they'd also started talking about these secondary operations that they would launch. They call them pinning operations. And the idea is to pin the enemy in place so he can't take troops away to reinforce the threatened front. So Fromel's was essentially a pinning operation. It had been planned along with a number of others that didn't eventuate. Um, and uh, the whole purpose of the thing was to support the offensive on the Somme. The Somme was the critical factor. The Somme was the key focus of the British attack. And so Fromel was always a second order uh, attack, if you will. But essentially, its purpose was to stop the Germans uh, moving troops away. To do this, um, the commander of the 11th Corps, Sir Richard Haking, um, was the one who was given command to do it. He had a composite force. The Australian 5th Division came out of the British 2nd Army, and Haking, who was a corps commander in British 1st Army, had the British 61st South Midlands, 2nd South Midlands Division. And so he had a, a two-divisional attack formation. And at six o'clock in the evening on the 19th of July, both of these divisions went over the top with orders explicitly to capture the frontline trenches in front of Fromel. And uh, that's what they attempted to do. And by 7.30 next morning, uh, they were back in their own trenches, having suffered by, for the 5th Division, 5,500 casualties, including over 1,700 killed, and for the British, 1,500 casualties with about 500 killed. It still remains the bloodiest day in the Australian Army's history. Do you think the battle should have been fought at all? That's a really difficult question. Um, and again, it's where you've got to avoid taking the battle out of the context in the time in which it, it occurred. Uh, the Somme, this is, we're now talking the 19th of July, 1916. The Somme's been underway for 19 days. Everyone knows that the first couple of days of the Somme campaign were a disaster. The British have huge losses, and there's no argument with that. On the 14th of July, the British launched the second phase of the attack on the Somme, and it's going much more successfully. The, the British are actually driving the Germans back, making quite uh, heavy inroads into the German line. So in the context of that, you've then got these intelligence reports that the Germans are pulling troops out to try and plug the gap, and they're coming from Lille. My humble opinion... Yeah, it was probably justified given what they knew at the time and given what was happening at the time. Um, what wasn't justified was the degree to which the battle was pursued. But again, that's a hindsight thing. We don't. You know, it's easy sitting back now. We know the battle fails. We know what happens down south fails. So it's easy now to say, oh, they should have stopped sooner. At the time and in the uh, at the place, um, yeah, I think it's entirely understandable and justifiable that the attack is launched. It's an interesting point that you make because we do look at the Battle of Fromel through this, uh, this, this modern framework uh, related mostly to the heavy casualties. I mean, any time you have a battle where that many people die, obviously it's going to be painted as a, you know, in a very negative light. But a lot of that gets reflected back on things like the commanders, for example. Haking cops a lot of flack uh, you know, regarding this battle as to whether you know, he went about it in the right way, whether the battle should have been launched at all, whether he should have called it off sooner, whether he employed his troops correctly. Where do you stand all, uh, on all that in terms of the performance of the leaders and the decision to attack it from L? There's a rule of thumb in popular uh, military history, particularly in Australia, that um, the higher the casualty count, the more incompetent or inept the commander. And and I, we argue against this perception, um, we, you know, without success all the time. There is very little correlation between the numbers killed and, and necessarily the competence or otherwise of the command. So many other factors come into play. So the British are rapidly pulling stuff out of the rest of the front line as well uh, to support the Battle of the Somme. So Fromel is launched. One of the complaints is with inadequate artillery. They actually had adequate artillery. They had one gun for every eight metres of trench, which is about what the British have on the Somme for the 14th of July. The problem is they have, don't have sufficient ammunition to sustain it for too long. But the real problem is the artillery they have are the ones who are poorly trained, relatively new to the front, inexperienced with their weapons. They're not going to do the job that the more experienced gunners down on the Somme were doing. So you, you, there's whole raft of factors that come into how effective your artillery is and in the first world war in any set piece battle the artillery is the arbiter of success or failure not the commander there is no evidence i can find that his plan is in any way flawed or wrong i can't i can't point to any major issue there are a number of uh, of mistakes in it but they're not the ones that contribute necessarily to its failure 
and they're the sort of mistakes that all commanders make, even our famous general, our good old General Monash. Uh, he makes a number of mistakes in his orders and his plans, um, but when he's making them, the AIF is a much more battle-hardened, a much more experienced, much more competent organisation, so it can compensate for the mistakes. In 1916, the 5th Australian Division, who does the attack, this is the first attack of the AIF on the Western Front ever, and this is the uh, major attack, and this is the first attack that the 5th Division has ever done and as a 5th Division. It's only just been created. It was only created in Egypt in January, February 1916, and here we are in July 1916, launching a major attack on the Western Front. So uh, we think that less than 20% of the troops in the 5th Division had had any combat experience. To that point, I assume that the commanders, Haking and the other generals that were involved in this, I mean, I I assume the plan wasn't to see that most of the 5th Division get wiped out during the attack and that the 61st Division would suffer huge casualties. So so where did it all go wrong? From this concept, I I understand, I agree with you, that this battle needed to be fought. You know, it was something that was important at the time. But where did it go so wrong that so many people ended up dead? The problem that we have is... um when they're devising this plan, there's still a lot of debate going on um, as to how to do it. Uh, is it going to be a pinning attack that's going to require infantry to get out of their trenches and go forward and seize a bit of the German line? Is it going to be an artillery demonstration, i.e. the guns will pretend there's going to be an attack and we'll do all sorts of manoeuvring and making the impression that there's going to be an infantry attack so that the Germans will keep their, their troops in place? The reason the confusion over whether it's a pinning operation involving an infantry attack or a demonstration becomes important. If it's a pinning one, you try and keep battlefield surprise by keeping your preparation secret. If it's a demonstration or you're, going to, or you're pretending to do it or you're doing raids, you let the, gem, the enemy know about it because you actually want him to react to what he thinks you're going to do rather than what you're going to do. What happens in the end is they don't seem to resolve either and the Germans know about it. The Germans actually hold up signs. The, I, I don't know. The battle itself is three days late. It was supposed to go in a couple of days earlier, but it gets held up. The Germans hold up signs in their trenches saying, when are you coming? Where are you? We've been expecting you for days. That's your, that's your first start of the problem. Um, the second part of the problem is, if you're any good, you're down on the Somme. So the two divisions that Haking's got, uh, the poor old 2nd South Midlands Division, um, it's it was... Up until the end of 1915, it's a depot division back in the UK. It's the division, it's the the, um, skeleton of a division that's used to bring in reinforcements, train them up and then send them off to its parent division, which is on the Western Front. At the end of uh, uh, 1915, uh, early 1916, the British decide they're short on divisions. So they send all these depot divisions out to the Western Front. And poor old uh, 61st, 2nd South Midlands, comes out, it hasn't got its artillery, it's it's deficient in um, troop numbers, it's deficient in junior leaders, it's particularly deficient in staff officers and planners, and it comes out and it gets stuck in this quiet sector, which is where First Army is at this stage. Um, but it's 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 uh, under strength, it's tired by this stage, by July, and so and it's not one of the you know the cutting edge British divisions at this stage. And as I said, the 5th Division's literally just arrived. It, was, it arrives in June. It arrives from Egypt in June. Most of them had never fired a shot in anger. Most of them had never seen the enemy front line. And so Pearl Haking's got two relatively understrength, uh, sorry, two untried, one understrength, one incredibly green division to launch this attack. The original plan was he was going to get three divisions, but because of the Somme, this gets cut to two. The original plan was he was going to have three divisions worth of artillery because of the the problems with the Somme. This gets cut to two. So all the way through, Haking is finding his plan being nibbled away and eroded at. He hasn't got a great force to start with. So how does he deal with this? Well, his first statement is he says to his commanders, this is a limited attack. The problem that he gets is that uh, James Whiteside Mackay, who's the commander of the Australian 5th Division, and a bit gung-ho, I have to say, who turns up on the Western Front, his division has the, quote, honour, unquote, unquote, of being the first AIF division to attack, there's no way he's going to do anything half-hearted or backward about this. He's a chance to show these Brits what good Australian boys can do. So he launches a major dramatic attack. The British commander, uh, Mackenzie, who's a bit more sanguine about uh, both the limitations of his division and what the orders mean, he is much more conservative. So he says very limited attacks. They both get a lot killed, but 
the Australians lose three times as many as the Brits. So, and I argue it's it's in, it's in largely the react the the way in which these two divisional commanders interpret their orders and how they implement the attack. But and the other problem, and this is the one that always gets me into trouble. The real problem is, of course, is it's this inexperience factor. The Australians have never done this. And attacking on the West Front is quite different from attacking in Gallipoli. And there's only 20% of this division even saw combat on Gallipoli. So the division is totally inexperienced. And they do some really dumb things. You know, they they attack, they don't they get lost at night. Um, the Germans, there's a German uh, regimental history that complains that the Australians were throwing grenades but neglecting to pull the pin out. Um, the Australians, in their enthusiasm, push beyond the objective and then don't secure their flanks, which means that during the night of the 19th, the Germans come around, they infiltrate around both sides and between the gaps in the line. So when the position becomes untenable in the early morning of the 20th, and the Australians have got to withdraw, they've got to fight their way back through Germans who've cut them off. So there are a whole raft of factors that go wrong and cause this to happen. But fundamentally, I think the reason for the high casualty count is the inexperience of the Australians, uh, largely the inexperience of the Australians, and the failure of the artillery to do the proper job in suppressing the enemy defenders. Roger, when you describe it that way, and I'm sure everyone listening agrees with this, it sounds like an absolute debacle. I mean, I spend a lot of time in the work that I do trying to demonstrate to people that the First World War wasn't as, as big a stuff-up as people often like to, uh, to make it out. But that just sounds like an absolute debacle in the way that this was put together. I mean, was this typical of battles that were being fought at the time, or is Fromel a bit of an exception? No, because down on the, um, on the Somme front, the battles are being fought even at this stage, with with ruthless efficiency. I mean, uh, a couple of days later, the Australian 1st Division goes into Poziers and fights a brilliant battle. Fromel is an object lesson that you don't use inexperienced, partially trained troops to try and uh, achieve uh, battlefield dominance, if you will. Don't use inexperienced troops, inexperienced commanders, inexperienced artillery in a very difficult set piece. I mean, there was nothing more difficult in 1916 than an attack on a German set defensive position. The German defenders at Fromel had been, the Bavarians, had been in situation for nearly a year. They knew the ground intimately, like the back of their hand. The Australians hadn't even seen it, but they were the only troops available that had, dare I say, sufficient um, strength in their division to launch the attack. So they had to be used. And inevitably, the result is high casualties. Roger, you've given a fantastic account of how this battle unfolded and potentially where it went wrong. You've also touched, though, in those words, I've heard you say a lot of the time uh, during those comments, you've said things like, you have to remember or we don't remember this in the right way. That's a really important question. Do we in Australia, through the lens of 100 years, looking back on this battle, do we remember it in the right way, in your opinion? That's a difficult question, and I hesitated to answer it. The reason is we remember things for different reasons. Uh, as a military historian, I'm trying to find out what happened, when, where, and why. A lot of people use their history, though, for other reasons. Um, there are a number of people who are writing popular histories today who are promoting this Australianness of the Australian performance on the Western Front, which, in my humble opinion, is misguided and misdirected misguided for a couple of reasons, one of which it involves denigrating the British, which I think is appalling. Uh, I'm a great fan of what the British achieve on the Western Front in four short years of war. The problem that I have with the way in which we look at our history, it's not new, but just think of it as a drinking straw. You put the drinking straw over the Australians and you look down at it from the other end and you don't have any idea of the context around it. You, you don't see who's alongside it. You don't see who's in front of it. You don't see who's behind it and supporting it. This is the problem. We take the Australian contribution out of the context and try and promote it. There were 10 colonial uh, Dominion divisions, uh, five Australian, four Canadian and one New Zealand, plus the South African Brigade. So at the, at the height of the Dominion contribution, if you will, there were 10 Dominion divisions. There were another 60 British divisions. So at, at our height, we're still only a relatively small part of the British Empire. And we're nearly all engaged in the fighting. The British support us. All our ammunition is brought by the British. All our food is brought by the British. Um, 
all the all logistic stuff is done by the you know maintaining the roads and railways being yeah we have a railway operating companies and we have transport stuff they're nearly always engaged in what we call the first line which is just behind the divisions all the rear area heavy lifting stuff that's all done by the british if we'd had to do that we couldn't have we could not have had five divisions on the front we probably would have had three at the most because the rest of the troops would have been engaged doing all this most of the artillery that fires in support of us um Apart from we have our divisional artillery, which is sort of organic to the division, but nearly all the heavy artillery that fires in support of us is British. Nearly all the air, air support that we get is British. We've got a couple of Australian squadrons. So we tend to look at it from this distance as Australians fighting within the British. Back then, Australians, Canadians and New Zealanders were an integral part of the BEF, and that's how they were treated. They were very good towards the end of the war, particularly. They weren't particularly good at the beginning, my humble opinion, 1916. Some of the divisions were... Some were good, some were... By 1918, I would argue that the AIF is one of the finest uh, fighting forces that Australia's ever produced. And along with about 10 or 15 British divisions, was always used as the strike force for the BEF and was used quite successfully. Our problem is that we take that and then we put all sorts of spin on it to say, oh, well, you know, the Australians punching above their weight and all that sort of rubbish. Uh, we weren't. We were a very good fighting force integrated into a much more complex structure and organisation. It's really great stuff. I mean, the, the the thing that strikes me, Roger, is probably the most controversial aspect of Fromell and perhaps the thing that indicates uh, a potential lack of understanding about the battle and its context was is the, the push that still goes on today to have Fromell listed as a battle honour. Because if people see a First World War memorial, they, they won't see the word Fromell printed on it. It generally gets rolled into the Battle of the Somme. What's, what's your take on this push uh, to have Fromell recorded independently as a battle honour? Well, in my last job, I actually had a, a, an official position on it. But the bottom line is um, I'm one of these people who is very, very cautious about trying to rethink the decisions that were made at the time. And at the time, every Australian division had a battle honours subcommittee formed of officers and men, and they were invited to submit claims for a battle honour to the battle honours through the Battle Honours process that ran between 1921 and about 1928. And the Battle Honours system was run by a bunch of senior British officers with Australians and Canadians on it. And there are one of the points about a Battle Honour, of course, is it has to be something significant. It's a bit like the old... Remember that old joke? What's, there's an old pop song, if everybody's, some, if everybody's somebody, then nobody's anybody. And they were trying to maintain the currency of the Battle Honour. So you didn't give it... Even for good fighting, you had to give it for something exceptional and outstanding. There's two sorts of honours. There's theatre honour and there's a battle honour. Theatre honours you qualify for if you spend a certain amount of time in the theatre, etc., etc. There are rules about it. A battle honour is for a performance above and beyond what could be expected. The 5th Division Battle Honours Committee didn't submit from L. They put in a whole bunch of other battles. They wanted the Somme because they saw, they understood that they were part of the Somme uh, operation, if you will. So if they didn't want it, in my humble opinion, who am I, 100 years later, to tell them that they got it wrong and they should have it? I think also, because a battle honour is not about casualties, a battle honour is about your battlefield performance, the 5th Division did not perform very well at Fromell. So to give them a battle honour for Fromell is to give them a battle honour for getting a lot of their people killed, not for, not for performing above and beyond what could be expected of a, of a similar formation under normal circumstances. Well, we've been talking about Fromell through the uh, through the context of the analysis of what went on from a military perspective, which is really important, and we should do it, especially in this centenary time. We should be looking back and asking hard questions about why battles unfolded as they did, how do we remember them today, and are there factors that we're missing out on. But I, I think the one thing we should stress and that we should never forget about is a lot of people were killed at this battle. You know, this was one of the battles that left thousands of families um, you're losing their loved one many wounded men came home from this the human cost of this battle was absolutely enormous and i think the one thing that that people remember more than anything else from this battle today is that human cost and nothing illustrates that more than what than what's happened over the last decade at a place called pheasant wood and i know roger you were very heavily uh, involved in the uh, the mass graves that were uncovered at pheasant wood and the work that was done there can you share a little bit of your perspective on on that story and uh, and your role in it as you know, for about 20 years, I was the Australian Army's historian and I ran the Army history in it. And I think it was in about 2000, 2001, 
I got this email sent to me by this bloke called Lambison Glazos from Melbourne. He was a drama teacher, and he's a proud Australian Greek. Uh, and he'd been to Fromel um, on a battlefield tour. Uh, Lambus was quite moved by this. Anyway, he sits down and he's, I can't remember the exact sequence, but he's, he basically sits down and he, and he does some numbers at the back of the envelopes. And he comes up about 160 short in terms of the number of known dead and the number of gravestones or known burial points. Because, uh, you know, we've got VC Cornet with, with the unmarked graves, but it's a mass grave. And he reckons we're 160 short. So to cut, you know, cut a long story short, he decides that he's going to find them. And so he and he gets a small team of rather rather clever people together and they start combing the records. And they comb the German records, they comb the uh, British records, they comb the Imperial uh, War Graves, which becomes the Commonwealth War Grave System records. They comb the Australian records. They find references to graves being found inside pheasant wood and all this sort of stuff and eventually they find reference to these eight pits dug to on the german side on the um I'm trying to think of the geographic between pheasant wood and the village of Fermil. and there are eight pits and lambus goes off and he gets a look at all the aerial photographs because by this stage aerial photography was really started to pick up in the imperial War museum and he finds pheasant wood with these eight pits and then a couple of months later, an aerial photograph shows five of these pits filled in. And he reckons he's onto a good thing here. He reckons he's found the missing 160. So he basically um, writes to the Australian Army and says, would we go and pay to have a memorial stuck on these, uh, on top of these pits? Uh, we basically said, yeah, right. You know, because we were getting uh, letters from people all over the you know, claiming they'd found missing Australians all over the world. You know, there was ones in Greece, ones in Sumatra and all that sort of stuff. And when we looked at them, we found very little evidence to support the argument. But we had a look at what Lambert said and we thought, oh, yeah, there's, you know, there's a bit of argument in this, but yeah, 160, that's a lot. Because remember, the, we had five years or nearly 10 years after the war, we had the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and the war, what we call the War Graves Units scouring French and Belgian countryside for missing dead and recovering them and, and reinterring them in cemeteries. Uh, we just, I just found it inconceivable that we could have missed a mass grave of 160. This just doesn't happen, you know. So um, we basically said to Lambus, yeah, right, go away and do some more work and come back with another proposition. And to his eternal credit, Lambus did exactly that. He goes away and comes up. Uh, they put together a really good presentation on it. And so I... He came back to me and said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I don't know. So I spoke to the chief of army at the time, a guy called Peter Lay, and said to Peter Lay, they've done all this. If we um, listen to their case and we think uh, we're convinced by it, will army back you know, further investigation? And Peter Lay said, yeah, sure. So we convened a board of military historians, the um, head of the war graves um, a, service at, uh, in DVA and, and his offsider and a whole bunch of others. And we got Lambus and, and his two colleagues to come and give us the presentation. And it wasn't exactly a friendly atmosphere. There was a lot of hostility to Lambus, particularly from the DVA side, because this is a very dangerous precedent. In about 1928, all the victorious nations had agreed no more speculative searching for, for the war dead from the First World War, largely because the local French and Belgian communities were sick of it. They were trying to re-establish their lives, re-establish their farms, rebuild their villages and get on with life. But every so often, some bloke would turn up with a shovel and start digging up their backyard. And they were getting jack. And it was also costing a fortune. The other taxpayers were getting sick of it. Uh, everybody was over it. So there was this agreement. I can't remember the exact year. It was either 26 or 28, something like that. We never did find the, the adjutant general from the UK, who was the one who sent out the minutes saying this, but it's one of those folklore type things. We know it exists and we know it's there. And I'm sure if we really looked hard for it, we could find it. But the bottom line was all the victorious nations stopped searching for their war dead after that point. If we found them, and this was the policy that had been in place from 1926 or 28 to whenever it was, if we found war dead, we would do our best to identify them and we would reinter them in the nearest appropriate Commonwealth war graves cemetery. And that's what we've been doing for years. And we've been finding, I mean, every year we find bodies. There are still plenty out there to be found, and every year we still find them.
the difference here was we were actually going to go start speculative looking. It was also interesting that this paralleled what was happening in the States. The US had been coming under a lot of pressure, particularly from the missing from the Second World War, particularly for air crew, when um, there was a lot of people looking for World War II airplanes to either rebuild or whatever. So they were searching the records and going out and looking, you know, sunken off, off tropical islands or in the, in the jungles of New Guinea, and they were finding the bodies of the airmen still inside. So there was a growing movement. Um, it actually came about because of the missing in Vietnam. Uh, there was a big push to go and search Vietnam. There was, I forget how many Americans were declared missing in Vietnam. And after the war, the, uh, the Vietnamese uh, didn't know where they were either. So there was a very big push and there was a lot of uh, investigation and excavation in Vietnam. And then it, it, it morphs into this bigger uh, issue of trying to find the missing in Korea and then the missing from the World War II. So this is happening in the US. So it's not like where the Australians are uh, breaking new ground, but we're going off doing our thing. And as I said, there was a lot of resistance to break with what had become the standard process up until that point. But to his eternal credit, Peter Lay said, no, no, um, you know, if if the evidence justifies it, we will go and have a look. And that's essentially what it did. Eventually, uh, Lambus convinced this very sceptical panel after, I think, two or three meetings. So we went out and we contracted a, a bunch called the Glasgow University Archaeological Research Division, uh, headed up by that famous TV personality as he is now, Tony Pollard, and a few others, um, to come and do what we called an investigation of the Fromell site. Now, um, and I also got my good mate, Major General Mike O'Brien, I'd learnt very early on that I was a little fat, balding civilian, so I had absolutely no impact or, uh, uh, what's the word, credibility with either the British MOD or with the French. If you turn up with a two-star, a two-star general, major general, and say, you're the front man, you go and talk, which is what Mike did. So Mike basically fronted the project and was running the project. I was paying, but he was running it. Well, sorry, the army was paying. Um, we got Tony to come along and do this exploratory. First of all, he did an initial one. Uh, we weren't going to invest a lot of money digging. So he came in one year and did this in, an initial investigation where he did a ground penetrating radar survey of the site, found the fact that the pits were still there. By the use of a technique called battlefield scatter analysis, they were able to determine the fact that these pits had not been disturbed since they were filled in in 1916. And so having decided that the pits were there and there seemed to be something in them, we didn't know what, uh, the decision was then made, right, we'd start a project and we would go and investigate. We actually got the Brits involved. The Brits were extremely reluctant. I mean, as the Brits said, you're only talking about First World War. They were worried about the precinct would be they'd start looking for their missing from uh, Waterloo or, you know, the Hundred Years' War or whatever. So they were very reluctant to get into this as a precedent. But we eventually went back and we did the exploratory dig, um, again run by Glasgow. And um, after, I think, three days, we found the first hand the first skeleton and we knew they were there then it became an issue of what do we do about this point my involvement comes to an end because it's such a big project now and the army history and i was not running it i was running from L. so i stood to one side and we stood up a working group uh, with mike o'brien still as the head of it and we then contracted oxford, oxford archaeology to do the recovery and identification and and which is what they did and uh, they've uh, they've extracted 250 Sets of remains, as, as the records suggested, somewhat more than Lambus's original 160 prediction, but nonetheless, he still did pretty well. And they've started using DNA to identify them, and by the Australian community has really got behind it, and by providing things like DNA samples, they've, able, they've been able to identify, I think the number's up to about 140 now. I've rather lost visibility of where they're at, but it was certainly... The net effect also was that the army then stood up what they called the Unrecovered War Casualties Army section to do this, because up until then the army history unit had done it as a part-time job, but now they have a full-time section within army headquarters, answers to their coordination area in army headquarters, and that's what they do. So they've recovered bodies from Vietnam, they've recovered bodies, a lot of bodies are recovering now from New Guinea. Um, yeah, they've been all around the place. And so that's basically the story. Then, of course, having found the remains, we got the new cemetery, the only cemetery that the Commonwealth War Graves Commission has built since the end of the Korean War. Uh, it was built at uh, Fromell, the Pheasantwood Cemetery. And that's that story. I could bore you to tears. It was a lot of fun. And 
we actually got got a bit of understanding what it was like to live in the mud because we were absolutely drowned. We were digging pits, and um, the soil around there is called Epsian clay. It's a gray, greeny gray clay. It's almost totally impervious to water. In fact, I think if NASA had used this stuff rather than those O-rings, then the space shuttles wouldn't have blown up because this stuff is just amazing. It was a major export to the UK to line uh, the canal systems in the 17th and 18th century because it's so waterproof. And the bodies were buried in this, which is why they were so well preserved. Uh, in fact, when we opened up uh, the first pit was pit three, I think, there was this overwhelming smell of death and decay. Uh, it was so overwhelming and so bad that we had a French battlefield survey team with us and the young bloke who was there couldn't go on. Uh, it, it, it just spooked him. He got sick and he had to leave. Uh, so, yeah, it was, um, it was a pretty traumatic experience. Interesting, but traumatic. It's such a it's such an amazing story. I mean, people have so many people have learnt the story of Fromel because of the work that was done with that dig. So I mean, you should obviously be very proud of the work that, of your involvement in it. It was a you know a really wonderful experience. It was I think everyone would agree that the the finding of those bodies and the fact that the new cemetery has been made and the identification of them has been uh, really quite wonderful. Um, Roger, thank you so much for your insight into Fromel. It is a it is a misunderstood battle. It's a controversial battle. It's a it's a tragic battle. So it's important we keep asking these questions and 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 reassessing what it means to us a uh, hundred years later. It's I, I think we owe it to the men that were there that we keep asking these questions and that we have a proper understanding of what went on. So thank you so much for your insights. It's been really wonderful. And uh, we'll definitely get you back on the podcast again. My pleasure. Thanks, Matt. And yeah, can I just say, I also agree. People get, I think, often get the impression that I'm not sympathetic to the plight of the men there. I am absolutely and totally sympathetic to the to plights of the men there. And if I can, as my parting shot on this whole thing, I always use this as an example of why when governments under pressure from taxpayers refuse to invest in defence before it's needed, the end result is a lot of dead soldiers. And that's exactly what Fromell was. It's, it's the result of underinvestment by Britain and Australia in, in, our, in, uh, in the military defence of, the, of the, the empire. And the, the net consequence was while we're getting ready to do it, a lot of young soldiers have to die. And, and Fromell is a classic example of that. That's a great point to end on. Roger, thanks so much for your time. Okay, Matt.